acute estimated uh, muscle driving pressure. So I'm going to uh, focus in a very practical approach because I think the principles were well discussed by the previous presenters. I have a small conflict of interest regarding EIT for this talk, but it's going to be mild. Um, so we have seen this figure of driving pressure. We believe that uh, in this paper the most important message is somehow expressed here, not exactly for mortality, but uh, barotrauma, which is also a good uh, uh, independent outcome, but not so much. But at least we can see that if we increase driving pressure for any means, by any means, you are going to increase the mortality and the incidence of bottle trauma. But the increase in tidal volume is not a necessarily bad thing, provided that you keep driving pressure under control. So this is very important because at the bedside, it, we have to face a very practical problem when the patient is returning to assisted ventilation and then you have to take a decision. I'm going to illustrate this a little bit better. So, first, first of all, I would like to remind you about these old papers from ventilator-induced lung injury, one of the most uh, seminal ones. And in this particular paper, and this is uh, alterations in permeability, this is lung edema, measured by different web, uh, technologies. But the important thing is that, as you can see, if you have positive pressure ventilation or negative pressure ventilation simulating exactly what your muscles, inspiratory muscles, are doing, and you generate a high gradient of pressure across the respiratory system, you are going to have a big injury. So this is a very common situation at the bedside. We have a patient under pressure control ventilation. You set a delta pressure of 20, PEEP of 10, and you have a kind of protective tidal volume. A few minutes later, the patient is awake, and now I have still the same mode, but is assisted pressure control ventilation. The patient is triggering every breath, and then you typically see this slight increase in tidal volume. If I had an esophageal balloon, I could easily track that here the transpulmonary pressure and inspiration is 22. Here the swings in pleural pressure are negative, and then my transpulmonary pressure may reach 34, which is a kind of a alarming signal. But I don't have the esophageal balloon. So what I should do at the bedside? I should immediately sedate and paralyze this patient, or should I? The evaluate a little bit further. So what we are proposing here is something very practical and we are doing this uh, in, in all patients as a routine in our ICU. We do something like this. Here I can understand that the driving pressure is 20 uh, because I see that the end inspiratory flow is zero and then I have quasi-static conditions. But here because the patient triggered the breath, by definition I cannot calculate easily driving pressure because I don't know the acting forces at end inspiration. So what I sh we could do here is something very practical, which is the following. You do just a very simple assumption that the lung does not change in minutes. And this is a very reasonable assumption based on many studies. So compliance of the lung does not change from one minute to the next it take hours or days. Uh, and then we know that driving pressure is tidal volume divided by compliance. So what you can do, I, I, I have this patient paralyzed or I just give a shot of propofol and then I measure lung compliance here. I make the assumption that a few minutes later the compliance is exactly the same, still 18. And then now I can calculate driving pressure, which is 550 ml divided by 18. And then I get very concerned. So for this particular patient, I, I should think about stepping back. Maybe if this number was around 15, I could consider eventually progressing to winning. 
But in this particular case, I know that I'm increasing mortality by two or three times. So the question is, why not stepping back? Um, and I like to put this because this famous paper from Papazian suggested that for 48 hours it's okay to do paralysis and you can even in improve survival. But I have seen in my ICU and across all the beds in my hospital, and we will have a very confused hospital with more than 20 different ICUs with different chiefs, that uh, it's a kind of sacrilege, or it's a kind of scene, very heavy scene, to paralyze the patient for more than 48 hours. I don't know exactly the reason. But uh, it's interesting because when the patients are in prone position, everyone is easy going with paralysis, and they paralyze the patient for five or seven days. But if the patient is supine, it's a very heavy scene. Um, it's a kind of mindset of people, but anyway, at the bedside, we are proposing that it's very important to calculate the total driving pressure applied to the patient, which is a sum of what you set in the ventilator, and typically this is slightly less than the level of pressure support because of the dynamic flow conditions. So if you set a, a pressure support of 8, very likely you are giving something like 6. And uh, the driving pressure uh, performed by the muscles. And then how you can calculate this, you can calculate the total sum. It's, and then this is just an assumption that you can also have at the bedside. But you, typically, if you give a shot of propofol, you have kind of relaxed conditions. Or if you use some maneuvers that we can apply at the bedside, you can get this number, which is the compliance, and then you can calculate uh, the total driving pressure. This has been validated by these studies from the group of Pesenti and Bellani. Um, they have shown that in different levels of pressure support, the compliance of the lung stays the same. But uh, we still have a problem to solve. First, we, we, in fact, I realized that commonly we have three problems, not only two. The first one is the religion problem that I have mentioned before. For some reason, people believe that the spontaneous breaths, they are much better than something that came from the evil ventilator. And from the physiological perspective, this is absolutely not true. The second point is that typically, I see some physicians that they believe that because you set a low level of pressure support, then your driving pressure it's not a problem because I'm using just five of pressure support. And then, as we mentioned, if you divide tidal volume by compliance, you typically realize that this is much larger than your set level of pressure support. And then, as very elegantly shown by Brian Kavner, um, if you have Pendeluft, then there is also a problem that your global driving pressure assessed by lung compliance is also underestimating the true driving pressure. So uh, let's talk just a little bit about this uh, uh, way of assessing the global driving pressure. And then later on, we are going to say a few words about this. So in this uh, interesting papers from Takeshi Yoshida, one from 2012 and another one from 2013, he showed that when you have lung edema in an animal with pressure control ventilation, when the animal starts to breathe spontaneously on top of this, typically you have a transitory improvement in the lung condition. And this is very common at the bedside. And we get let's say, enthusiastic about the patient because he starts to have some spontaneous breath and looks like that the lung recruits, the blood gas improves, but then a few hours later or in the next shift, you see this, a big deterioration of lung edema. And uh, the interesting thing about these studies of Takeshi is that he showed that this happened if you have an increase in tidal volume, and then obviously you have also an increase in driving pressure because you have the same blood compliance. But this is also true if your tidal volume is not that big, but you have a higher driving pressure because your lung compliance is very bad, like in the patient I have just illustrated. 
So whatever the type of armor, high or normal or protective, like 6 ml per kilogram, you can have a big deterioration of lung injury in this scenario. And interestingly, if the animal has mild injury, you can see an improvement in blood gas, but typically if the animal has a very bad lung condition, what you see is something like this, an initial improvement in oxygenation and then a big deterioration because you have progression of lung injury. Remember about this famous slide from the ArtsNet seminal paper from 2000, high tide of one versus low tide of one. High tide of one always produces a better blood gas, but doesn't mean a better prognosis. And then um, the second part of this talk, uh, and this is just a, a warning signal uh, after the exposition of Pendeluf that Brian did. Some people, and I, we did this mistake a few years ago, and this was a very important mistake, because I think this was the mistake that drove the art trial. This mistake is telling us something like this. If you are in pressure control ventilation and you have negative swings in pleural pressure, your transpulmonary pressure is going to increase and your tidal volume increases. When we are in volume control ventilation and now I have a negative swing in pleural pressure, your airway, drive, uh, airway pressure drops. And then, as a result, your transpulmonary pressure does not increase uh, theoretically if you have a homogeneous lung. And then your tidal volume does not increase and then it's difficult for the physician to realize that maybe in this case, if you have the pendulum described by Brian, you may be in trouble. So some people believe that by using volume control ventilation, you can control your transpulmonary pressures and then you are in safe waters. And unfortunately, it was demonstrated by Takeshi and others that this is an old legend and it's absolutely not true. So uh, restricting tidal volume by volume control ventilation is not a good solution. Besides the fact that sometimes trying to restrict tidal volume, you may enter a situation of breath stacking, like in this patient enrolled in the ART trial, in which this is a tidal volume of 6 ml per kilogram. The ventilator was set at 5 ml per kilogram, but then in reality the patient was receiving 15 ml per kilogram of tidal volume because of breath stacking. And you can see triple stacking here and the ventilator does not give you any warning signal. And then the second problem that we have mentioned here is that even restricting the tidal volume, it is possible that you have the pendeluft, which is a migration of air from the dependent lung to the upper lung, or vice versa, in fact. When we start inspiration, the lower lung sucks some air from the upper lung. And then this causes a local overstretch in the dependent lung, much larger than what you see during paralysis. And this sometimes is equivalent to a tidal volume of 15 ml per kilogram. This was very well demonstrated in patients and animals. So I'm not going to the mechanisms of uh, Pendeluf, the Brian has already explained that this is caused by a solid-like behavior of the lung with localized and forced concentrations in the pleural cavity. We measured this with sensors. We realized that the local driving pressure can be much larger from what you can detect from the esophageal balloon. And this is the reason why you see on CT that even having severe atelectasis and lung injury in this animal, this region, very close to the diaphragm, and is the precise region suffering pendeluf and then large stretching, has this color of overdistension like in the upper lung. And then uh, we can monitor this at the bedside and uh, by electrical impedance tomography and in a recent study as shown by Brian we can clearly demonstrate that these areas inflame. 
and it's a severe inflammation as I'm going to show in some examples of different animals. Always this stretch is happening in this dependent part and doesn't matter the mode of ventilation. Here is pressure, assisted pressure control ventilation, here is volume control ventilation. The only way to avoid this big stretch is to paralyze the animal in this particular condition. Next slide. Something is not working. Can you move this slide? So, whenever we have too strong effort, this dorsal overstretch occurs independent of the mode of ventilation. And then something that, uh, these are some examples that we, we, are, we are going to show in some animals. When they perform very strong pendeluft along hours of mechanical ventilation, they have a first hit of lung injury here, but 24 hours later, they have an increase in inflammation because of this big overstretch. And guess how much was the tidal volume here? It was 5 to 6 ml per kilogram. So this clearly shows that there is a over localized overstretch that you cannot sense in the global uh, signal from the collected in the proximal areas. And it's interesting to see that the injury is very close to the diaphragm, the regions of really big stress. Okay, I'm having some problem with the slides. And then, so let's, let me just quickly uh, go to the conclusions. When we have this pendeluft, like, and we clearly can see this pattern of movement in electrical impedance tomography, we can calculate how much overstretch you are presenting in the dependent lung regions. And we can, for instance, here to show that this particular region in white, they are receiving an equivalent tidal volume of 8 to 10 ml per kilogram, while the rest of the lung is receiving 6. Just one second. Next slide, please. Okay. Next, please. Okay. Just a, a, an interesting consideration. If I can measure by EIT this extra volume that I'm getting in this region, I can make the assumption, like in the previous slide, so I cannot move the slides. I can make the assumption that there is a linear relationship between local compliance and volumes. And then I can calculate the local increase in driving pressure. And this is a project that we are doing now because now we can calculate the global driving pressure and we can calculate also the added driving pressure in this region suffering pendeluft. And I think this is going to be a very useful monitoring at the bedside. And if we want to promote the strategy uh, that uh, was suggested by Ewan, which I like very much, we have to obey the principles of having a lower localized and global driving pressure. Okay, let me just go to the last slide because this is not working. Okay. Um, again, I would like to, uh, to call your attention. First of all, that uh, this religion should be out. Certainly, spontaneous breaths are even worse than mechanical breaths because you can have an increased venous return with increased lung edema. It's very important that your global driving pressure can be much higher than what you set in pressure support or pressure control ventilation. And I have seen patients that were at five of pressure support with 40 of effective driving pressure. And uh, in all patients that I see levels above 30, they died. Um, and uh, if you have pendeluf, it's something that you can predict, either having an EIT or just watching the patient and observing very strong efforts and signals of distress of the patient, especially at low peak levels, you can imagine that your 
local drug pressure can be above what you can measure by calculating compliance and dividing by tidal water. Thank you very much.